Hi there, I'm going to attempt to explain the basics of sonata form in under 10 minutes. It's really going to have to be 10 minutes because I haven't had breakfast yet, so uh, let's see how well I do with this. Okay, so uh, just to give a bit of background, uh, the term sonata comes from the Italian word sonare, which simply means to sound. And at its basis, the, the term sonata simply means an instrumental composition, as opposed to a sung or vocal composition, which you would designate with the term cantata. Um, now, sonata form is basically a more complex, evolved version of a Baroque dance form, such as rounded binary. And it's a form that actually evolved over a very long period of time, and, uh, and contains actually some very ancient principles. Um, so, before we start getting into that, just one important distinction, uh, which is that the term sonata form is not synonymous with the sonata. So, for example, there are all sorts of instrumental pieces that are called sonata that might or might not actually employ sonata form. As a quick example, um, in the 20th century, the German composer Paul Hindemith wrote a long series of instrumental compositions for a solo instrument and piano called sonata. Um, very few of these are actually real sonatas. So, um, sonata form per se is used uh, very often in the classical period um, in the first movement of multi-movement works such as concertos, symphonies, uh, string quartets, and so on. And it tends to be the most complex and sort of the most uh, uh, sort of intellectually challenging movement, if you like, of these pieces. At its basis, sonata form is a dialectical form. And what that basically means is that you present an idea or thesis, uh, and then you present an opposing or contrasting idea or antithesis, and then through a process of rational argument and discussion between equals, you attempt to arrive at some form of synthesis. So um, this is an extremely ancient form of, uh, of discourse. Um, you see that all the way back in the Socratic dialogues, and basically the, the same thing happens in the sonata form. So the interesting thing about that, as far as I'm concerned, is that uh, we tend to think of musical forms as being in some manner sort of absolute or contingent only on musical ideas, and actually that's not the case. They tend to point to other things, and in this case it points to something that is actually basically linguistic um, and very, very old, so I think that's quite interesting. The golden age of sonata form coincided more or less with the Enlightenment, and you can see that throughout the 17th and 18th centuries there's an attempt to codify, um, simplify, and sort of uh, standardize musical forms. Um, and this actually didn't last all that long, and already with the advent of, uh, of Romanticism, and particularly with, uh, with Modernism, it basically uh, grinds to a halt. So, um, one other important point that I'd like to make uh, is that um, at its essence, sonata form actually requires neither themes nor even necessarily ton tonality. And uh, that's something that practically no one uh, will tell you except me, so I'm going to say it again. Uh, at its essence, sonata form requires neither themes nor even necessarily tonality. And in fact, in the 20th century, you can find pieces that do away with both and that are still actually authentic real sonatas. So, for example, the second Boulez piano sonata. Well, that's a piece that actually attempts to destroy the sonata form from within, and does so rather successfully, I would say, um, but it contains neither tonality nor themes. So, nevertheless, it's a real sonata. So, just bear that in mind. Um, so, almost any traditional uh, sort of textbook attribute that you could possibly think of uh, of sonata form has at some point been negated by a classical composer. So, that's a very interesting thing, because um, if you look up sonata form in a, in a dictionary or a textbook, um, you'll often see these sorts of uh, formal layouts that say this is what must happen in the sonata. But uh, if you look at pieces by Mozart or Haydn, you can almost always find an exception to any of these uh, attributes. So, just to give a quick overview of what usually happens in a sonata, you usually have uh, three sections. So an exposition, a development, and a recapitulation. Now, even there I have to stop myself because there are Mozart sonatas that do not have a development section. But anyway, in the vast majority of cases you will have an exposition in which basic materials are laid out as well as a fundamental opposition between two harmonic regions. Okay, and in the development, well, who the hell knows? Anything can happen. Absolutely anything can happen in, in the development. The principle is that you take the materials laid out in the exposition and you sort of uh, engage them in a dialogue and you sort of cut them up and rearrange them and see what they can do. 
You sort of take them on a walk, if you like. In the recapitulation, you restate the materials from the exposition in order, but with one important distinction. So we're going to have a look at how that functions. Okay, so in the exposition, you may or may not have an introduction that serves to establish the mood and or the dimensions of the piece. So, for example, uh, there are certain Beethoven symphonies, or late Haydn symphonies in particular, that start off with a rather grand uh, introduction. And this grand introduction uh, might have nothing to do thematically with the rest of the piece, but it allows the listener to grasp the sort of overall dramatic uh, context of the work and give a, sort of have an idea of, of what its dimensions are going to be. What generally happens in the exposition is that you want to establish a harmonic region, uh, you want to establish a sense of home base, and you're going to usually have a theme that uh, is associated with that home base. So um, I've illustrated that with the lovely painting by Vermeer at the left, and um, perhaps your uh, particular home life doesn't resemble uh, this painting, that's not really the point. Uh, what I'm trying to explain is that you want to start things off with a sort of sense of familiarity, you want to establish something that is clear and stable. Now, the interesting thing about that is that, of course, we are human beings, and uh, we can't just sort of sit around comfortably drinking wine at home forever. We would be bored out of our skulls, so there's always a sort of grain of, um, let's say, uh, unease that makes us want to start moving. We want to get out into the world. We don't want to just stay at home forever. So um, here's what happens next. Okay, so uh, we get bored at home, and we decide to adventure out into the world. So um, you can see that this can sometimes have frightful consequences, but in any case, um, we modulate or we transition from uh, the initial harmonic region that's been established in the exposition to a second harmonic region or, or harmonic pole, and we do this by modulating. And once we get to this second harmonic region, we often have a second theme that is associated with it. Now I say often, it's not always the case. So for example, in a lot of uh, um, sonata forms by Haydn, for example, you have only one theme. So the theme is, is stated uh, at the tonic, or the first degree, then you modulate to the dominant, and you hear the same theme again. So um, sonata form is not necessarily um, a question of an opposition between two themes. I think it's better to think of it as an opposition between two harmonic regions. Um, so this movement away from our home base creates a tension, because um, we've decided to adventure out into the world, um, all sorts of strange things can happen, and this creates a sort of a, a nostalgia, because we're aware of the fact that we are no longer at home, we are aware of the fact that it's possible to be at home and that we've chosen not to do so. So this creates a tension that must be resolved over the course of the piece. Um, this exposition, generally speaking, is repeated in full. So the composer will have a double bar line once we've finished with uh, harmonic region B, and we start the process over again. And the reason we do that is to have a sufficient degree of structural redundancy so that um, we can easily remember the materials that are included in the exposition. This gets very important when we start to move into the development. So, as you can see here, uh, things get rather confusing in the development. We no longer know which way is up. Um, and what actually happens is that we take elements of the themes or the ideas that were laid out in the exposition, we chop them up, we, we sort of uh, uh, rearrange them, we recombine them in all sorts of different ways, and um, what happens is that uh, we are engaging these materials in a sort of dialogue. Um, and we're seeing what they can do. And during this process, uh, different things can happen. New textures can arise. So, for example, we might take fragments of the themes that, are, that have already been heard, uh, combine them contrapuntally uh, by means of fugue, for example. Uh, there could be a, a, a sort of fugal episode in the middle of a development section, or a, a sort of imitative texture, or you might have purely harmonic textures. All sorts of things can happen. Um, and the other thing that might very well happen in a development section is that you have sort of harmonic sequences that lead you astray from the home base, and sometimes actually quite far astray from the home base. So um, the, the more remote you get uh, from the sort of initial starting point, uh, the more complex the piece will tend to be and the longer it will take to resolve this sort of, uh, this sort of trajectory. So there's a generalized principle of instability in, um, in the development section. So anything basically can happen. Now, 
In the recapitulation, um, as I mentioned earlier, we have the restatement of materials from the exposition in the same order. Um, so basically we've, we've returned back home and hopefully we're older and a, a little bit wiser from the experience, but there's one major difference from the exposition, which is that whereas in the exposition we had two opposing sort of poles or regions and we had to modulate in order to get from one to the other, in the recapitulation we stay in the home region the entire time. So for example, if we have two themes um, in the exposition and one is uh, sort of on the tonic degree and the other is uh, on the dominant degree, in the recapitulation they will both be heard um, on the tonic degree. So um, that is basically the means by which we attempt to resolve uh, these oppositions that have been uh, functioning throughout the piece. Uh, so we hear everything in a kind of unified context at the end. And this uh, recapitulation may or may not be followed by an optional coda. The word coda, by the way, just means tail. And the coda is essentially a, uh, a structurally unnecessary section. We don't really need to have it in order to fulfill the requirements of sonata form. Um, but it allows us to sort of um, uh, increase our sense of having arrived back home, generally speaking. Now, in rare cases, in very lengthy Beethoven sonatas, for example, you might have a coda in which uh, you have sort of new material introduced, but that usually does not happen. And generally speaking, it's just a, a sort of way to, um, to sort of uh, emphasize this concept of return. So that's about it for now. I am going to get something to eat, and I hope you found this informative.